Okay, let's come back to our lecture on the book of Isaiah. Book of, today we meditate only these three chapters, book of Isaiah chapter one, two, three. Isaiah is great for two reasons. The prophet Isaiah is great for two reasons. Number one, he lived in momentous days, in critical days of international upheaval, and he wrote what many consider to be the greatest book in the Old Testament. William Sanford Sassor, Lassor said this, and uh, if we understand from Black Clock, he said, we see Isaiah, Prophet Isaiah move with fearless dignity through the cars of his days. Firm in his quiet faith, sure in his dawn. I like this statement. Firm in his quiet faith and sure in his God. If you look at the entire Bible, particularly in the book of Isaiah, we understand this. We all know this book has been divided in two major parts, structure of the book, particularly with this, with its 66 chapters. Isaiah is the longest prophetic book of the Old Testament. Most scholars agree the book falls naturally into two major sections. So chapter 1 to 39 and chapter 40 to 66. The outline goes like this, uh, chapter 1 to 39, there is a lot of condemnation, emphatic uh, condemnation, saying, oh, the coming judgment. And in chapter 40 to 66, we see consolation, condemnation and consolation. God condemns at the same time he consoles. He is such a father. He disciplines and he encourages. We see this flower in this entire book. Major themes of the book are like this. Sons name as signs. The servant, we look at Jesus as the servant. Some theologians call them the servant songs. You know, most of the times when the, when the professors teach, they teach so much theology, uh, which is good for some, but uh, along with the theology, we need to have some implication. The servant psalms, they call it the Psalm of the Isaiah 53, and uh, they mix with the psalms, and then there is so much theology. Who wrote, who is the servant? Some scholars say the servant is Israel, some and uh, some scholars say servant is Jesus, and some scholars deny saying that this has nothing to do with the Jesus, it is only somebody else, Cyrus, and these are so many interpretations. And in theological class, they discuss about all that. That is not very much required for us, who is her, but we are very sure this is very much related to the Lord Jesus Christ, the servant. The, oh, the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer, and also we see eschatology. These are the themes run through the book. Written between 700 to 680 BC, Isaiah's ministry in Judah, 740 to 681. I am not going to get into this big uh, no, archaeological evidence of this and that, but most of the scholars, they discuss about saying that the book of Isaiah, uh, manuscripts have been found in Qumran community. Uh, this, in that Qumran uh, community, when uh, these uh, shepherd boy, shepherds, when they were roaming around, a shepherd boy threw a stone and he heard the sound of a pot and those pots have been discovered. And a lot of, you uh, know, when you Google about Qumran, community and Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly when you type Dead Sea Scrolls, you get a lot of material on that, uh, a lot of uh, theories. But this book of Isaiah has been found. And when they compared with the Bible that we are using with the English translation, absolutely 
we see the accuracy and uh, we see exact uh, translate uh, exact uh, message that we have today in book of Isaiah has been found. This uh, dated back. Uh, the four studies produced elaborated date uh, date ranges between 335 to 324 BC. The manuscripts which were written in those days, 335 BC. Now, 21 century, 21 century, 2021. With our Bible, if we compare that manuscript in 335, there are no um, mistakes. We see the accuracy of the Bible, and the, that proves the inerrancy and fallibility of the Bible. And uh, there are so much theories around that. So you read more on that. I leave that to you. The great Isaiah scroll of the Qumran community is dated at no later than 100 BC. All messianic prophecy in Isaiah was written well before the birth of Jesus, including Isaiah 53. This gives a lot of evidences to believe the New Testament because the New Testament prophecy, the, the stories of Jesus Christ have been documented and written. And those documents, even if we have a doubt about the Bible that what we have today, you know, this Qumran scrolls have proved the infallibility and uh, inerrancy of the Bible. Anyway, that's uh, related about the uh, other subject. I don't want to guess this. The Q text is uh, substantially the message as the received text of the book of Isaiah that we now read in our English Bible, the Q text. Big picture of the book of Isaiah. If you look at the bigger picture of the Isaiah, these are the four themes run through. Isaiah shows the two-sided nature of God's character. Mercy and judgment. Look at here. God is merciful and God also a judge. Grace and discipline. God is gracious, passionate, and also he disciplines. Justice and forgiveness. God judges, but at the same time, he forgives. Exile and salvation. God sent people of Israel to exile. At the, at the same time, he preserved, he protected, and he saved them from the foreign oppressive structures. Chapter 1 to 39, usually most of the scholars and uh, preachers call it as judgmental chapters. We see the judgment of God. All unto you, all unto you. And chapter 40 to 66, we see redemption, judgment and redemption. We see both. Particularly 40, chapter 40 to 66, we see three splits. One is God's gracious dealings with man. 40 to 48. 49 to 50, we see God's gracious provision for provision of redemption. Dealing with man, gracious dealing with God, gracious provision of redemption, and 59 to 66, we see God's gracious promise of hope. We are not in a hopeless situation. There is a hopeless situation around us, but there is a provision. Gracious promises of hope are there to move on. The timeline of book of Isaiah, of course, I discussed about this timeline. You can read it later about the kings and their times, what happened. That's not our purpose. This is not a history class. It is just a kind of understanding the prophecy and the themes. Line by line analysis of book of Isaiah 1 to 3. We go a little bit exodus here. If we go, verse 1 to 4, we see God's people have forsaken their master because of their sin. Who forgot God? It's not people who do not know about God. Who forgot the Lord Jesus is not the uh, people of other faiths. It's the people of the faith. Even now across the globe, we see Christians forgot their Christ. The Isaiah's prophetic message is very much relevant to today's context. Verse 5 to 15 says they are being disciplined for their hypocrisy. No prayers answer. God will not answer the hypocrites. Hypocritos. We discussed about it. It's the word hypocritos. 
Well, 16 to 17, we see God desires obedience, good behavior, not religious. What God requires today, obedience and good behavior. Obeying to God and good behavior so that people will have the darshan of God. God doesn't require religiosity. What is religiosity? Religion. And you know, a kind of cover up. God needs obedience and behavior. And uh, Christ never came to establish a religiosity and religion. But somehow, I don't know from how, it, the, the evil one took over the lead. And so much Christian religion spread across the globe. What you and I need to do, we need to help people to understand how they need to obey God and have the good behavior. Summary here in this uh, little paragraph in Exodus, if you look at God detests wrong, even by very religious people. Let me say it again. God detests wrong. Even by very religious people, uh, we may be so religious, doing so much mission, sending people, giving money, and you know, all, doing so many charity activities, uh, being a director, you know, of course, I'm a coach director, and doing this and that. If I project my religiosity continuously, I'm doing such a nuisance. I am not called to do that. You know, God is not looking at my very very much a religion in me. What God wants from me is obedience and good behavior. Even if I don't do anything, that's fine. But doing has so much to do with religiosity. Yesterday evening, I think it was about nine o'clock evening, um, one of uh, my acquaintance, he was a student when he came to the Lord and very close to me now and then, uh, he calls me, you know, when then Guru, this and that. He called me because he understood that I am a little bit discouraged by the Borwell issue. And almost one hour we discussed so many things. One thing he asked, Anna, why so many pastors and no, uh, forget our pastors, why so many people, even in our fellowship, uh, why many people are dying, particularly our friends? One thing quite interestingly said, I don't know. What's your understanding? I asked him. I don't know because I cannot be judgmental. You tell me what. He said, I think people are so crazy to do mission activities. I don't want to mention the name of the organization because he comes from that. He's still active in that. Of course, I was from that. He says, our people are so crazy to do so much, you know, going out, visiting, Bible studies, this and that, and so much activity oriented. They, they are not so happy to be at home, relax and refresh. So much running, running, running when virus is so much outside and uh, our people are so crazy. They removed the mask, everything. They visited houses within that little unlockdown time. I think from uh, August to December or January, so much activity happened. I think that is true. So much religiosity. What, and they're quite interesting. He said the other thing. And now some people are saying, if they're not doing anything, they feel so guilty. And they feel so guilty and I'm not able to do anything for God. And on this pandemic situation, we don't know when we die. This is the time to do mission for God. Let's do this, let's do. It is all a false religion. We are not doing, we are not doing what God wants us to do. God commanded us to restrain and uh, remain silent, enjoy with family, or maybe do something from inside, but we don't want to do it. So crazy, you know, the one day when uh, one God servant, he was telling, brother, how long we will be inside, stuck down? Where is our faith in God? You know, it's been almost a one year now, we have never participated in bread and wine. Why are we afraid of so much life? No, let's come out. You know, he was giving the theology of coming out. Friends, here, book of Isaiah gives us a good theology saying that God doesn't require our religiosity. What is religiosity so much? You know, participating in all this, taking part in bread and wine, meeting prayers and you know, praying. 
it's a part of spirituality but spirituality is much more than all these rituals they are all rituals you know participating in a uh, lots of uh, this is a ritual instituted by jesus even if you are not doing you are not going to die your salvation is not going to lose if even if you are not going to meet physically you are not going to lose your salvation today particularly in this pandemic situation god silently communicated to humanity through the doctors through the experts you know because where do they get uh, wisdom ultimately they get wisdom from god even government gets wisdom from god because god is the above ruler we believe in theocracy god is the ruler you know we have a protocol saying that hey guys you be in the home don't open temple don't open this and that we need to go to them obeying them is also spirituality but how how do we communicate this truth god desires obedience a good behavior what is good behavior obeying to the laws of this context but people are prone to religiosity religiosity that's the reason many people some people they, they are not dying but they are spreading the virus everywhere so we need to i say it's very relevant even today god disciplines us when we do wrong was one to 17 what are the lessons we we'll learn here god disciplines us when we do wrong religious acts do not make up for our sins religious activities may not help us to get rid of the sin very funny some people participate in bread and wine so that their sins will be washed away some people go to church every day so that their sins will be washed away we need to go to church but our sins will be washed away only by the personal relationship with the lord jesus christ God does not listen to the unrepentant. This is a very strong statement, and I strongly believe this. Even now, also, very much relevant. God does not listen to the unrepentant. The word here, listen, means it's not that he is not listening; he is listening, but he will not answer. Why? Because you yourself. are withdrawing from god the individual himself is rejecting god it's not the god's problem it is the individual's problem and there was one to 17 what is the bigger theme hope there is a hope in the lord jesus christ was 8 uh, first john was uh, first john chapter 1 was 8 says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness if we claim we have not sinned we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives how mercy on me a god according to your unfailing love according to your great compassion blood on my transgressions god is compassionate he will forgive us let's move the second paragraph in this chapter 1 18 to 31 talks about the lord has a plan to redeem israel jerusalem cleansing even the worst sins of the willing and obedient this again isaiah is bringing this theme willing and obedient he is condemning but there is a hope for the obedient verse 28 to 31 we see the corrupt that resists the lord will perish being torn down obedient will will be forgiven the corrupt will be pushed into the eternal damnation summary of this paragraph you see the lord will purify the willing and uh, destroy the rebels the lord will purify the willing there may be pain there may be disturbances but he will purify the purify them from that context but he will destroy the rebellious those who are rebellious will be destroyed very much relevant even now lessons are truth in this paragraph is god can and will cleanse even the worst sinner if they are willing and obedient again the word willing and obedient 
Obedience is the key to success in our life. God is sovereign and Jerusalem will be a righteous, faithful city. And most of the time when we try to expose this, uh, do the exposition of our, this uh, chapters and we try to preach, preaching only the condemnation part. Oh, what do you, God is going to bring ju ju judgment on you. Yes, that's fine. But there is a hope for the willing and obedient. The obedient will have a direct access with God and he will be forgiven. He will raise like a shining star in the darkness. God is sovereign. And Jerusalem will be a righteous, faithful city. Those who re 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 reject the Lord will perish. Both he and his work burned up. Look at here. Those both he and his work will be burned up. My life and my activities will be tested on the great white throne judgment of Christ. My personal life, my private life, my public life, and also my work that I do. What are the position or whatever the context, whatever the organization, my work will be evaluated. Isaiah was very much cautious and warning them. And let's when we look move to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, we, we see God has a vision of people living in righteousness and peace. Even today, now God has a vision for people of India. Living in righteousness and peace, to live with a righteous degrees and peaceful environment. I strongly believe that. Well, 6 to 22, we see God's people are no different than pagans and will be humble for their pride and love for their work, what they have done or me. Prophet is very powerfully helping the individuals to understand, hey guys, you are not different than the pagans. You will be humble. God's people are no different than pagans. However, they will be taught and follow him. One thing God teaches, lessons to his people, and he will protect his people. They will come back to God. Lessons in this paragraph we look at ultimately Numbers of people will follow God and this will result in peace, God's bigger plan. Ultimately, multitudes will follow Christ. That's what we see in Revelation. Every knee will bow in his presence and every tongue confesses that Jesus is the Lord. Presently, God's people are like pagans, proud and lovers of material things. Isaiah talked about this. Even now in this 21st century, in 2021, even after Corona effect, God's people, I'm not talking about uh, the people, uh, the others. I'm talking about, let me put it, Christians. We, otherwise, I'm also part of that bigger community. Sometimes I am like pagans, you know, proud and lovers of material things. In this pandemic situation, of course, there are so many people going, uh, helping, a lot of generosity, going an extra mile, serving. But there is a sinful attitude with the proud and lovers of material things. God will discipline his people so that they will walk in the light of the Lord and have peace. God will teach a lesson to the pride. He knows how to humble them. Let's go to Isaiah 3, chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. We see the Lord will take from Judah food, water, and leadership. It's very strange here. Hey guys, you are proud, arrogant, not listening. What I do, I will take away the food, water, and leadership. There will not be any leader to guide you. There will not be any food to eat you. There is no water. Even if there is no food, we can live for some time by eating. 
leaves are this and that. But if there is no water, you can't survive. What is life? Life settles around the water. The Lord says, I will take away that. The very, your essential thing will be gone. This is very terrific. This pushes us to live a righteous life. Verse 8 to 11 says, the people bring this disaster on themselves because of their frag, frag, flagrant sin. Because of their flagrant sin. And rebellion to the righteous will be protected. Although the righteous will be protected. You know, the, the people bring this disaster on themselves because of their own sin. What, is, what do they bring on themselves? No food, no water, no leadership. I am not a prophet. I am just an evangelist. I am just a Bible teacher. But I can tell from my assumption, maybe my subjective opinion. I'm not, I don't say that it is exactly may happen or maybe it will happen, but this is my assumption. In the coming 10 years, coming 10 years, or maybe in the rest of the time, many, many, so many groups, so many people, they die without food and without water and without leadership also. The church will split. So many people are going to die. There will be death awaiting there. I'm not scaring, but this will happen. Not be, may not be because of the corona. If we may somehow protect ourselves. This may we may have some vaccine, but something else will come because there is so much rebellion attitude from the people. The other day, I really thank Dr. Joseph. Uh, he was telling. Uh, people became so so much religi religious, even the Hindus are praying, Muslims are praying. You know, in one sense, that is good, that is true. But in an another sense, during this pandemic situation, people became more rebellion and more sin increased compared to the pre corona context. You may ask why. Now everything is man, people are at home. I don't have time to explain everything, but it is the prediction. If you interview some people, we know people become more religious, not spiritual. Verse 8 to 11 says the people bring this disaster on themselves. Even now, people are bringing it. There is a de destruction, devastation, disaster from the virus. And there is another disaster coming from the rebellion attitude of the people now today. Verse 11 to 26 talk about the men and women, especially the leaders will be disciplined. Particularly these prophets, they were always with the leaders. Look at even Jesus, hardly he condemned the lower workers or uh, the, the lower clergy or the common believers. Even the prophets here also, Isaiah um, uh, straight away talks to the leaders. He knows, he says, will be disciplined. Judah has brought judgment on themselves because of their sin and rebellion. But the righteous will be okay. The righteous will be okay in all contexts, in all times, in every geographical nation, everywhere, righteous will never stumble. This is a biblical principle. This will work forever and ever, no matter what happened out there. If you are righteous, honest, truthful, you go through a lot of pain and agony. But you will stand like a pillar. That's what Prophet Isaiah encourages. Lessons to learn from this particular paragraph. God can protect the righteous while disciplines the sinful rebellious. Judgment, we can call it as a discipline, can be a lack of food, water, leadership, and freedom. Now what? How should we respond to discipline and teaching? First Peter, Peter's 
a letter to the Christians who were going through a painful trial. He says, be holy. And he says it over and over again. Be holy. Even in this pandemic situation, what God expects from us is to be holy. Be holy. Don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Be holy. Continue to do good. Clothe yourselves with humility. Another suit of humility. We may have a shirt and tie and the suit, but above it, we need humility. He will never be shaken anywhere. Even if you leave that man in the, even in Telugu, we say, Sapta Samudram, even at the beyond seven seas, you just dip him in that sea, he will swim and come to the shore. Who? The one who clothed himself with the humility. Result 1 Peter 5, 10 to 11 says, God will restore, making strong, firm, and steadfast. God will restore us. We are not weak. We don't to be worried and disturbed and discouraged. If you continue to be holy and humble, you know, there is a way that God raises us above. We never knew what God has restored for us. That's the reason the Bible clearly says, no, I have seen and no ear has heard. No mind has conceived what God has preserved for him. God has preserved amazing doors for us. God has preserved amazing blessings. The key is here. Humility opens. Hum humility is the key. Pride is the uh, enemy. May God continue to help us. Isaiah tries to help this prideful people to say, hey guys, you are so pride, proudful. Come back to God and uh, clothe yourselves with humility. May God bless all of us to have that uh, attitude of humility in our daily life, in our, in our uh, relationship with uh, people around. May God continue to help us. Keep watching. If you haven't uh, subscribed, you can subscribe to the channel. And if you have any doubts, you can contact me.